All right, welcome to the show, everyone. My guest today is Sonny Verma. He's the founder and CEO of Tudor Bright, which is the largest in-home tutoring service in both Canada and Australia. Sonny has seen firsthand how through mentorship and tutoring, every student can reach their potential. Since launching in 2006, Tudor Bright has grown to 1,000 plus tutors, serving over 10,000 clients. Sonny is a sought after expert in the education and technology space, making frequent appearances on television, and his writing has been featured in Reader's Digest, Huffington Post, and the New York Times. He's also a previous nominee for the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. I wanted to bring Sonny on the show to find out how he thinks about education in general, how he launched and grew Tudor Bright, and what's next for him. So, Sonny, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I wanted to get a bit of a sense of your background and your story. So, could you just share with us, what were you doing before you started Tudor Bright? Um couple things one I was traveling and then um well I guess it's probably better that I start uh I when I finished my undergraduate degree I did not I had no clue what I wanted to do with my life so I did what I thought was logical and that was go get a master's degree uh and I did my master's of business and in doing my master's of business I, I was extremely inexperienced I I thought it was really easy academically but I thought it was extremely uh I, I don't know it just didn't make a lot of sense to me that all you spend so much money, get a designation to do a job that you dislike. And one of my biggest uh, realizations there, being one of the younger people in the class, that I didn't have a wealth of experience. Um, So I decided to go travel the world with the remainder of my student loan. Uh, And that's where I found myself in Southeast Asia. That's the first time I visited Australia. Um, I was gone for about a year and a half. It was amazing. And I came back to Canada. Uh, and realized I had a, a massive, massive debt to pay off. Uh, so I took a job as a management consultant, and uh, I did that for mm, probably about a month-ish prior to finding Tudor Bright. Right. So you only lasted a month. <laughs> Man, I'm lucky I lasted a month. I, uh, every day, every day was a case of the Mondays for me. It was, it was yeah, hellish. Right. Yeah. Well, it's it's good that you're able to recognize that, I guess, because a lot of people feel the same way, but it takes them a decade instead of a month to realize that so i'm glad that you did yeah it was, it was really interesting i used to my friends and i tell them like man this this what this is what adulting is this is what the real world is and they said yeah you know you get used to it don't worry I, I know it sucks i know you you know you have the sunday scaries the case of the mondays you you feel like shit throughout the day you just can't wait for the friday um th- that's really normal don't worry you get used to it that's like saying you're used to getting punched in the face and you eventually become numb, numb to it. That doesn't make the punch okay though, right? So that's what, that's what we tend to live our lives that like we accept brutality, we accept sadness, we accept depression, we just say it is what it is. Well, if we constantly say it is what it is, guess what? There's no motive or inclination to change it. So accepting it, under, first of all, acknowledging is one thing, accepting it's another thing. For me, accepting it was, was uh, terrible. I, it was terrible for a few reasons. One, um, I think the world's really fucked up. I think we have this notion that it's okay to live for the weekends. Um, I was, like when I was starting Tudor Bright, a lot of people would say like, you know, you're kind of you're kind of crazy to to leave a, a well-paying job. It was amidst in the 2008 2009 uh, economic market crash, and you want to start a company where you have zero experience in education. You're not a certified teacher and what actually makes you think you're qualified? And the truth is that I really enjoyed, I was volunteer tutoring, which I really enjoyed. Uh, but secondly, um, I realized that I dreaded every Monday. Uh, that was the uphill battle. Waking up, like a Sunday night was more of an uphill battle than having to quit my job, move into the ghetto and knock on doors for a living to tell people I'm a new tutor in town. That was significantly more difficult was, was staying at home on a Sunday night and dreading what Monday would feel like. Mondays, you know, if you actually think about Mondays as one seventh of your life, Mondays are, are so important. If you were on your deathbed, what would you give for one seventh of your life? That's a constant question I'd ask myself over and over again. And, and every time I asked myself that, I'd be like, well, you know, Sonny, you still have the other, uh, you still have the other days of the week to enjoy, right? The truth is you don't, you, you really don't. You, you feel like you're, you're, you're drained the entire week when you do a job that you have no passion and no excitement for. This is your life. If you aren't going to make the most of it, who will make the most of it for you? 
And also, I think that's the, I think the number one rise of depression for adults in this world is that our current success is far less than our current potential and we don't know how to bridge the gap. Yeah, absolutely. It makes total sense and you're right. It's, I think um, we were talking before we were recording about Dan, Dan Martell and I saw that he made a, a similar post talking about that of, you know, most people just wish away five sevenths of their life and then spend the, the other two getting drunk so they don't have to <laughs> think about the next week that's coming. And even if so, you if you look at like you even just like if let's say you're lucky enough to sleep eight hours a day, let's say you work eight hours a day, you're at sixteen hours of your day. Let's say you an hour to get to and from work, which is pretty normal in any metro city. You're at seventeen hours a day, and let's say it takes you an hour to get ready for work, right? That's eighteen hours of your day. That's eighteen hours of your day doing shit that doesn't inspire you. Eighteen hours of your, of your day is seventy five percent of your life. That's 75% of life that you are not enjoying. You could say, I have the other 25%. You know, I can get my side hustle on. Not too many people actually get their fucking side hustle on. The truth is, this is what we do. And I, I can say this because I used to be one of one of these types of people. I know a lot of people who actually subscribe to this. The other 25% of our life, we go home, we relax, we turn on the TV and say, I just want to Netflix and veg out. I just want to veg out. And, and you know what the sad part is? The, hum- the definition of a human vegetable is a mindless, numbless person in a coma. And this is what we wish upon ourselves. So if, you, if we go through this redundancy over and over and over again, you know, one day we're just going to look up and be like, what the fuck did I just do with my life, right? Like, it's, it's really interesting. We, we live for the weekends, but the, the reality check is that all seven days were created equally. Like every, every day of the week is created equally. We're the ones who, who gave names to the days, right? The truth is the sun sets and rises in every single day of the week. There's 24 hours in every single day of the week. And every single day of the week has the potential of being fucking awesome if we are living or willing to live the life that we want to live. But most of us actually just succumb to living whatever has been given to us without it ever challenging it for something better. Yeah, it makes total sense. You see it too much. And I definitely want to get into that and how you're kind of changing that in a way with, with Tudor Bright. But I was wondering what your what your education experience was like growing up because I think a lot of this, I don't know, I'd be curious to hear your opinion. I feel like a lot of this kind of conditioning into that, that way of thinking a lot of time does stem from how we grow up and, and our education. So I was curious how, what was your education experience like when you grew up? Do you think you had a good education or do you think that there were things that were were missing from it well i think the way you define good um i mean the truth is i don't think many people have a good education i think i don't think the school system i'm speaking internationally because we have offices um obviously outside just one location um it's internationally speaking i don't think there's there's like most public education systems are complete shit most private education systems are complete shit um, so did I learn my ABCs and one, two, three? Yeah, absolutely. Do most, most people? Yeah. But the biggest problem with our education system is that we look at student achievement as the biggest factor of success. So how well can you perform on a standardized test in Australia? You have NAPLIN and every other country has some sort of, um, some sort of similar thing to, to, um, measure a student's achievement. The truth is the student achievement test, irrespective of what country it's being administered in, has nothing to do with the student's well-being. Nothing to do with your Mm -hmm. your self-worth, your self-confidence, how you feel. Uh, Like it actually like the one of the most logical systems in the world is our education system. Right. Like the reality is, let's say you have a full time job and you, let's say, aren't very good at your full time job and your boss and writes you a review every single quarter telling you how shitty you are. And then you have to go home and show your parents how shitty you are. And then they get really mad at you and they reprimand you for it. And then when you go to work, your coworkers make fun of you for not actually being very good at your job, right? But for some odd reason, year after year, they promote you without even giving the skill set. So you're promoted to do more without with less. If that was any of my friend's situation, I'd say quit your job. But that in a nutshell is our education system. Students go year after year without the skill set to get promoted grade after grade as if it's some sort of achievement, which it's not. But you need, in most countries, a 50% to actually pass. That actually makes no sense. That means 50% of the information is missing. That is actually fucking crazy. How do you build the foundation of anything with 50%? How do you build the foundation of anything with 70%? And this is the problem, is that we we build it like this. Um, So what happens is when when a student progresses academically, you get shot. You you literally, year after year, just compounds. And eventually, this takes a massive toll on your mentality and what you feel that you're capable of. 
And because we don't have the the rep like the way to actually rectify this, is that you just limit every year instead of as you progress by grade, you actually limit potentials and possibilities for your life. If you're six years old and you want to be an astronaut and you're told you're not a very good math student and you buy that belief, by the time that you're 13, 14, you the the feeling or the belief that you can become an astronaut is gone. It's completely gone, which is really, really problematic. And that's yeah. what, so for me, um, no, I was never a great student. Um, I never actually, I, academics wasn't a vehicle to make myself. It was a vehicle to really break myself. I, I felt many times insecure, inadequate, and one of the best things about tutoring, especially uh, when I first started out, um, I had to relearn every subject that I hated, and I realized how easy it was. I realized that a lot of the times the way it was practiced in my life made it difficult. Like when a teacher says, listen up, because this is the hardest unit you're going to have, well, you just set me up for failure if I hate the unit, right? It's a, it's a lot better to, to give me the, the tools instead of giving me the mindset of what is going to be required. Give me the tools that are required, not the mindset. Let me develop the mindset along the way. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting last point you just said there that you realized it was easy. It was just wasn't taught in the right way. And that was kind of the, the problem you saw with the education system and it's a daunting, daunting problem to take on. So I was wondering if you could just, just tell us quickly, what is Tudor Bright and how did that, I guess, how did that idea come into fruition? You, we sort of have the background of the problem, but how did it actually come into fruition? Yeah, so we are, uh, we're, we're a tutoring service that's like no other. What we really do is specialize in raising a student's self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence, alongside of course raising their academics. But for us, academics is just a vehicle to instill characteristics of greatness. For me, the most important thing is to show students that they're capable, that they're capable of anything and everything that they're going to put their mind to. So when, when I work on characteristics like grit and perseverance and resilience, when I work on developing habits of gratitude and overall happiness, and when I work on their self-esteem and who they are as an individual, then academics become just the byproduct of what we've really been really targeting. So the best part of, of what we get to do is show kids that they're capable of everything. And, and that was really the premise of it. It really started when uh, I got a call from my friends. Uh, uh, got a call from my friend. She told me about a younger sister who was failing grade 12 English. And because she was failing grade 12 English, she was considered an outcast uh, of her family. And, and because nothing was working, they had this revolving door of tutors and Unfortunately, um, nothing was sticking, and she just bought the belief that she sucks at English. And if you, if, if English is the primary language of the country that you reside in, and you're not very good at it, and it's a prerequisite for every single university, irrespective of the degree that you're going to study, well, most likely your future potentials go down the drain. So they just asked me to come in and give her a helping hand. English was never my specialty. She, they were just like, you have a little bit of spunk. She has some spunk. Maybe you guys can dive together. And that's exactly what happened. We started to work together. And we, what I realized is that she was just scared to, she was just scared to try. Um, the first thing she said to me is, is <laughs> I won't forget this, is, Sonny, I don't know what you're doing here. I can't even write. This was my first, uh, like, first student, so I felt pretty nervous when, when you get that sort of uh, reaction from somebody. So I, I took a pen in my pocket and I placed it in front of her. I said, can you write? You can't write. She looked at me really confused and she began to write that statement. As soon as she'd done, I grabbed the pad of paper out of her hand and like a, I looked up at it and I was like, ha, ah, well, you obviously can write. You just wrote, I can't write. And she laughed. Okay. And when I showed, told her, like right after, I'm like, you know, you've been taught it's better to never try than to try and fail. When in reality, <laughs> by not trying, you fail by default, right? Yeah. So why not? Why don't we just create a safe environment for you to try? Let's let's remove the limitations you already created in your head, and let's test these limitations because I guarantee you we're going to break them if we test them. And that's what started to happen. We started to break limitation after limitation, and our grade started to skyrocket. Um, for me, uh, this this became like a, a passion project. I was like, this is amazing. I'm seeing this person thrive and grow, and it's like it makes me feel like I'm I'm superhuman because I'm giving her the skill sets for this. Uh, and I hated my job. This was like a few weeks into the management consulting gig. I literally hated, hated my job. And uh, I remember walking to my car one day and I had this, uh, I, 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 it, it was just something wasn't sitting right. And what wasn't sitting right, it was that I wasn't practicing what I was preaching. You see, like every single time I thought about like leaving my job, I felt like I was hitting wall after wall after wall because 
I truly felt like I was between a rock and a hard place. Uh, the truth is I had a job that helped pay my student loans and paid my rent, uh, yet I hated and I tutored for free, but I loved it. So my pithy moments like, well, what if I could make money doing what I really loved, which was giving kids the self-esteem and the academics that they can use to thrive in anything that they're going to do in their lives. But I kept bumping into like these mental roadblocks and then it hit me. The only time I've ever really hit a wall, honestly, is when I went for a run outside and I hit a wall. The only time I'd ever been between a rock and a hard place is that is if I went mountain climbing and a rock fell on me and I was stuck between a rock and a hard place. And it and so it's the same concept of the limitations that my first student had is the same limitations I had for my own life, right? Like the I, I've given I've given the same mental credit to physical devastation that never even happened right they just like the truth is i'm not hitting a wall i'm not between a rock and a hard place i just have to mentally accept what would happen if i quit my job to pursue the dreams i really wanted to and i remember waking up the next day after thinking that through and i walked to my employer and i quit my job uh very soon after i really it felt like a big relief but i realized i couldn't pay my rent so moved out of uh, a downtown, beautiful downtown metro city into the ghetto and just started knocking on doors, telling everybody I'm the new tutor in town. Um, and that's how I got my first handful of students. And it was fantastic. I, the, it would have taught me, though, even though I was making significantly less money, I was charging, I think, $5 an hour, which was significantly below minimum wage at the time. Uh, I felt good, man. I felt like I felt like I was doing something of purpose. And I knew that the dollar value can change, but the purpose can't. So the more I felt confidence in my ability, the more I could charge and, and I can and I could figure this throughout the way. But taking the first, you know, few years of living below a poverty line to to live my dreams was the best investment I ever made myself. I love that, man. That's that's such a such a key point that not that many people are willing to do. I think take that initial pay cut when you know it's what you want to do and the right thing to do. And then, as you said, you, the money can change, but, but the purpose, purpose can't say. So. I love well, that. Let me, you, let, let me tell you this, okay? Because one of the best benefits of working with kids, one of the best benefits of working with kids is I did see what we were all like. We were all, you know, five, six, seven-year-old kids at one point in our lives, right? We were all teenagers at one point in our lives. Like there was, there was, this is where our curiosity was at its highest. This is where we, like, give me, give a kid, <laughs> Give a kid a, uh, a paper box and they're going to space. Like literally that is converting into a spaceship and for hours they feel like they're on Mars. It is amazing, right? But when I work with kids, I used to, when I used to be the tutor, I used to do this um, really cool icebreaker with them. I'd ask them two questions. The first question I'd ask them is, what do you want to be when you're older? Basic question, I get basic answers, right? I got a doctor, lawyer, engineer, nurse, cop, whatever. The same shit I said when I was growing up, the same shit. We say generationally, for some reason, it's just a regurgitated answer. Now, I take the same thing and ask the second question. I say, in my hand is a magic pill. If you swallow this magic pill, you can become great at anything. What would you become great at? Their eyes widen, their ears perk up, there's hesitation, excitement in their voice. They say, I'd be an astronaut, I'd cure cancer, I'd be a rock star, right? So I hear all these cool, amazing, like vast ambitions. But there's a really sad underlying theme here. I took the exact same kid and pretty much asked him the exact same question. I said, what do you want to be when you're older? And if you could be great at anything, what would you be? Yet the answers were distinctly different. Mm -hmm. So why? Why at such a young age do we suppress our hopes, dreams, and our ambitions, right? So when we get older, we're taught to, we're taught that buying nice things or getting a really strong, secure job is the right method to happiness when the reality is we have the highest level of depressions and sadness in the world. We have to go back to our childlike behavior and start to dream again. Because when we dream again is when things become possible, right? It's, and it's, it's really interesting because when I do this experiment with kids, right, you know, their parents come up to me and say, Sonny, that's so amazing that you got my kid thinking ambitiously. It's so amazing that you got them excited about their future, but uh, can you please simmer down? And I look back to the parents like, yeah, so why would I simmer down? They said, I don't want to get their hopes up. You don't want to get their hopes up? What direction do you want their hopes to go? There's only two directions their hopes can go, and you want to push their hopes down. You know, the singular definition of depression, you know what it is? It's hopelessness, man. And this is what we do. And we do it to ourselves. Like, well, it's a mechanism of protection for ourselves to say, I don't want to get my hopes up. Why? Why wouldn't you want to get your hopes up, right? Like, we're taught that it's better to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. But it, 
And, and in your podcast, you probably heard this over and over again, that if you want to achieve anything in this world, you first have to believe and your actions have to be aligned with your beliefs. So shouldn't you be preparing for the best and hoping for the best? But unfortunately, we teach the opposite. We teach doubt. We teach fear. We teach that trying is scary. We teach that if you want to achieve anything, it's based by luck. This is the biggest problem. Like this is this is this is where like the root of all problems actually lie is in our mentality that we don't dream anymore. And because we don't dream, we don't feel like things are possible. We think that things are some sort of mystical, mystical like 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 presence has to be bestowed upon us in order for us to achieve anything, which is completely false. I mean, the the thought of achieving anything, the the solution of success has been has been pretty tried, tested, and true. Right for every single human being that's walked this earth has given a very very similar narrative of how they achieve something. Every single one, but unfortunately, we don't follow that narrative. We follow the narrative of statistics, and the problem with statistics is that there's been 104 billion fucking human beings who have walked this earth. Not one of them is you. So how do you compare yourself to them? Right, genetically speaking, you are 100% different. Your eye color is different. Your fingerprint is different. The way you think is different. The way you were raised different. Even if even if you were like born as a twin you are still different like that's the craziest part yet we don't take ourselves as different we take ourselves as norm like living in the normal which is complete bullshit because the second that you can segregate from the normal and you want to be the standard deviation if you're a study statistic they want you to be within the bell curve that's bullshit go outside the bell curve that's where the magic of life happens and that is not just it being an anomaly that could be anybody any human being is capable of this yeah, couldn't agree more. I love that. Go outside the bell curve. And it sounds like you, you guys do a hell of a lot different to your average tutoring company, I guess. And you sort of touched on a few points helping uh, the kids outside the academics, which I love. And one of the things that, that you say as well is that your tutors have to be a, a teacher, but also be a mentor as well. So I was wondering if you could just explain exactly what that means and what, what the difference is between, I guess, a tutor, a teacher, sorry, and a mentor. Yeah, they, well, I mean, the teacher is, is someone of authority, right? Um, which is a, a it, which is true. It's someone of authority that can dictate your future um, and essentially signs you mark. Perhaps they're gonna help you or perhaps not. It's, it, it could be up in the air. The, the biggest problem is that is the way a teacher has the authority over kids, I think. A mentor is a lot different. Um, so. Let me explain in terms of like why uh, like the mentorship approach is much different because school and it teaches you a few things. It teaches you it's it's more important to belong even if it's at the bottom totem pole. It teaches you it's more important to be accepted by others than to be accepted by yourself. It teaches you that life is hard, work is hard, and school is hard, and for some weird reason it's not supposed to be fun. And most importantly, it teaches you to never question your bosses, your parents, or your teachers, but for some weird reason. It's always okay to question yourself. A mentor reverses that. It teaches you that it's more important to love yourself than anybody else. A mentor teaches you that it's, even if you don't belong, doesn't mean you are not worthy. And most importantly, it teaches you to be curious, to be curious about the world around you. Question, question your authorities, because that's how progress is made. Because in your own curiosity is where you learn, right? Like intelligence shouldn't be defined by IQ. Intelligence should be defined by curiosity and ability to take feedback. It teaches you that feedback is beautiful. It's not that you're scared of, because the, the, the truth is we don't assign you a grade. We, we don't. What we do is help you progress. So the difference between a teacher and a mentor is pretty significant. Is that one is that my number one my number one job as a teacher is to get you through the grade. My number one job as a mentor is to make sure you feel happy about your life. Yeah, and it's a huge, huge difference and and I love that you actually define that because it's it's so important to have that that mentorship. I, I couldn't agree more. Well, I, I can tell you something that's really interesting, right? So we we've done a, a some really cool experience uh, experiments with different universities and one of them um, that uh, I conducted kind of on the offshoot was called oh I call it the honest experiment I called the honest experiment because I did it for a group of teen kids and I and I told them that I would I, the reason why I'm calling it the honest experiment is because it's just between them and themselves it's not that I will never take up the the assessment that I was going to give them with any like it's just for them there's no sort of uh, um, grade or assignment or anybody even going to review it. Mm -hmm. So I told, so these kids walk in the room uh, and I tell them that they have two sheets of paper that's going to be sitting in front of them. 
Uh, and in each sheet of paper, they're gonna have 60 seconds to answer two different questions. And I go to the front of the room and I dictate the first question. I said, I want you to write down everything you change and everything you dislike about yourself when you look in the mirror. The clock starts ticking. By then in 60 seconds, there's cheers dripping from their eyes, their hands are sore. We didn't plan a five minute breather, but we need to give it to them because they're emotionally distraught. So they go take this five minute breather, right? They come back into the room, they sit back down. I go back to the front and I dictate question number two. I say, now I want you to write down everything you love about yourself when you look in the mirror. 86% never start. And those who do finish within 18 seconds. It tells you where your head's at. It tells you why are we, are, why do we develop a sense of negativity and critique so high that we forget what we love about ourselves? You know, it's, it's really interesting asking somebody to talk about how much they love about themselves. And it's, it's weird because they're like, oh, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't want to be that into myself. If you don't want to be into yourself. Who do you want to be into? Like, that's the reality. Who do you want to be into? Like, fuck, if there's one person that you need to be into, it's yourself, right? And when people say that's not egotistic, like, like I come off of, e like, that, that would make them feel like their ego is really high. Well, mm -hmm. then if, if that's the way you define ego, that's just complete, like, complete stupidity, right? Mm -hmm. Like, the truth is, like, what is wrong with self-love? It is the most beautiful form of love in the world. If you, like, like, we are missing love in this world, like, because... Like the truth is most of us are scared of self-love. We don't have abilities to practice it. And then we feel weird when we feel good about it, right? The truth is you can only give love if you have love. It's like money, man. It is, it's truly like money. If you ask me for a $20 bill today and I didn't have a $20 bill, guess what? I can't give it to you no matter how much I want to give it to you, right? Mm -hmm. but, it, but the truth is if you ask me for love, the only way I could help you develop love is if I've developed it myself. That's the only way. That's the only way. Just because I am shining bright doesn't mean I dull you. If anything, it means I could shed more light on you. That, that is what we need to start teaching every single kid. That's what we need to start teaching ourselves, right? Practices of self-love. Trust me, we have a lot of practices of self-hate. People are like, no, I don't, right? Yes, you do. When you go in the mirror and you put up your makeup on the morning, you know the number one form of makeup in this world? You know what it's called? Concealer. Think about that for a second. I'm going to conceal my insecurities so you accept me. That is not a form of self-love, man. That is not a form of self-love. That is not your most authentic self. But unfortunately, we've been bought this, right? We, we've been told this over and over and over again that it has just been ingrained in our heads. So getting people in the practice of the opposite, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with makeup, but at least have the counter of it, right? At least have the counter of it. Like, it's interesting because people say affirmations don't work for them. I'm like, trust me, you're giving yourself affirmations, just not the right one. Negative affirmations are still affirmations. Yes, that's very true. It sort of doesn't matter if you're saying negative or your brain can't really tell the difference between the negative and the positive. Um, oh, no, absolutely, man. And the power of love is like, let's say you take two twins that are born, right? Identical, identical in every single feat. They have the exact same hair, the exact same eye, the exact same facial structure, the exact same body type, the exact same mental aptitude, the exact same IQ. But there's one distinct difference. Their parents chose to one love more than the other. Which one do you think is more likely to be successful, which one you think is more likely to thrive, which one you think is more likely to be happy. Of course, the one that was given more love in the first place. That's the most beautiful thing is that is that you can give it to yourself and you can give it to others if you make it a practice. Makes total sense. So I was curious what you think because a lot of parents will only get tutoring for their, their children if they're struggling in a certain subject, like maybe they're, they're weak in English like that example you gave before, or weak in maths and they want to improve that. But do you think that everyone needs tutoring or is it just those kids who are kind of struggling and falling behind? No, the industry has drastically changed, man. It is, it is a, it's, it's parents will call for a specific issue, but low grades is just a symptom of low confidence. That's what it is. Um, the second that, you know, like when a parent calls in and is like, hey, my child needs help with year 12 math or whatever it is, right? And we start to do a little bit of a dissection on the phone of, okay, well, what's caused this? How long has it been going on for? How do they feel about school? Is it affecting their confidence? Bingo, right there. Yeah, you know what? They're really, really sad about it. It's really affecting them, you know? They're really scared. They're worried about their grades, their future. They're, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, and they, they feel like their whole lives is going to be crumbling if this doesn't get rectified. Wow. Okay. So why don't we work on both simultaneously? Get the grades up, but only use it as a vehicle to actually build the foundation of confidence, right? 
because the truth is when a student is going through rock bottom, it's the best place to build confidence. Actually, when you're going through anything in your life, any adversity, the best place to build your confidence is at the bottom. Everything but any building, anything that's ever been created, its foundation is always laid at the bottom. That's what we got to do for ourselves. So, no, I don't, I don't think, uh, I think parents call because of the symptom, but the cause is always something that it's always been something that I mean, we work with probably more students than any in-home tutoring provider across the world. And like, it is like, it is so interesting because the, the story of the parent is always identical. I just want my child to be happy. I want them to feel comfortable in their own skin. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, it, it, it's like, well, whose skin would they feel comfortable in if it's not their own? Right. We can buy the nicest like material of cotton and silk and merino wool and whatever it is. But the, the best fabric in the world is your own skin. And the fact is most people don't ever feel comfortable in it. So that's what most parents want. They want their child to accept themselves. Mm, makes total sense. I love that, that you dig, dig beneath, beneath the surface and find the, the root cause. And I guess it's a case of also just asking is if, if that person is reaching their potential or not. And if not, which a lot of, well, let's be frank, none of us fully reach our potential, then you can obviously help them help them get closer to that. So I love that. And one thing I, I was also curious about, because for me personally, <laughs> when I was in school, there was, we'd occasionally do these like workshops on goal setting. So, and it was kind of like half assed and the teachers would kind of call you in and just kind of sit you down and say, oh, like, what's something you want to do this semester or something like that? And you'd write something down and then, never really look at it again and it kind of didn't really do anything but in my adult life I found goal setting has been really useful so I was curious to hear your thoughts on that for for kids in particular do you think setting kids should set more goals and I guess what's the right way to do it yeah I think that I don't think that the process of setting goals changes whether you're an adult or a kid I just think it's a it's a technique that you learn as an adult because of, of the desires change right the truth is a goal needs, you know, the stem of any goal is a desire. What do you really, really, really want? That's a big fucking question, right? And for kids, especially when it comes to their academics, it's really interesting. Like, I'll, I'll be talking to a kid and they'll say, uh, I really want to get, you know, a C plus. Let's say they're failing. Okay, well, what do you really want? An A. Okay, now we know what you really want, right? The truth is, is there's always an underlying thing that we really want. Sometimes we're scared to admit because we think it's so impossible it's unfathomable to ever achieve but that's the first question what is a true desire right because guess what if the desire isn't like aching inside you like you really really want it you'll drop the goal immediately right it it, it makes absolutely like eh, i'm okay then still with like a, a d minus you instead of a c plus but when you're going for that a things change right you get into championship mode it, all of us human beings do it's like wait what if i am capable what if i can the second thing is after you understand what the desire is what price are you willing to pay? So what are you willing to add and subtract in your life? What habits and behaviors and actions are you willing to change in order to achieve this, right? It's easy to do an audit. What's taking up your time? Perhaps it's Netflix. Perhaps it is Fortnite. Perhaps it's a bunch of other shit that you just are like, yeah, I'm spending a little bit too much time here. So are you willing to cut that? Yes. Okay, then what are you willing to add? I'm willing to study longer. I'm willing to work harder. I'm willing to pay more attention. I'm willing to ask the teacher for extra help. Okay, great. And every single day, do you have this statement? What do you really, really want? And what are you willing to give up in order to achieve it? And when do you want to achieve it, Bob? Right? Do you read this to yourself every night and every day? Because that constant reminder teaches you about the sacrifice that you're willing to make for your goal. And then we talk about it as a sacrifice in a negative sense. It is not. Because every day that you feel progressively moving forward, holy shit, that without question changes the entire trajectory of your life. Because that is the stem of confidence. Yeah, I love that. And it's definitely important that the kids set more more goals, I think. So I love that. And I was curious, I need to, to maybe switch gears a tiny bit and talk about a bit of the, the business side of actually growing TutorBright because that's something I'm curious about as well. You're obviously doing really important work with it and, and I love everything you went through there with, with how you actually do that. But I was curious how you really went from where you started initially where you said you were knocking on doors getting your first few clients for $5 an hour in 2006 to, to where you are today with, you've got over a thousand tutors that are help working with 10,000 plus clients. 
sort of can you fill in the gap there of how that happened because um i think that's a, that's something interesting we can take a lot uh, from of how you got there yeah um first uh, <laughs> uh yeah it, it's 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 a really interesting journey because I've been doing it for 10 years. Um, I think the stats that you were given are slightly uh, older. Um, we have tens of thousands of, of tutors and tens of thousands of clients now. Um, yeah. And a lot of that, um, I, I, like, the truth is, like, there was, there was, it, there was no direct plan um, in terms of, like, that, that, we, that we started, you know, that I thought of in, in – um, in year one to, to now that we're in year 10, um, it was a lot different, man. It, it, it was, it was the vision never changed. How I got there definitely changed. Um, I, I, I knew from day one that we were, you know, I'm, I didn't start to play second. And I also felt that there was a massive, massive issue in this world when we looked at the education system. And I, the opportunity to give people the gift of self-esteem and self-worth is, it will, will make my life feel very, very, uh, worthwhile and, and valuable. So um, I never wanted to stop doing this, but the way the way it started was genuinely, um, well, one, uh, changed, uh, <laughs> changed because of uh, my mentality. So when you're starting a business, um, everybody talks about how it's an uphill battle. Like it's really, really challenging. Like you're going to go against the grain. The truth is you're never really climbing a mountain and you're really never going against the grain unless the people in your life are creating the grain. Mm. That's the reality. The hardest thing in this world to do in, when you start a business is what they say is the naysayers, the haters or whatever, right? Mm. And, and we all have this narrative about like people coming in our life that are telling us like, uh, you know, I wouldn't do that. It's going to be really challenging. You're a big suck up. Like, like your seating is not very high. You know, X amount of businesses fail within the first year. What makes you different than like the next guy that's doing this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those are all, that's, that, that is all bullshit. Uh, and we always talk about overcoming these people in our lives. The truth is, we just don't overcome them. We insert other people in our life who have massive, massive impact. So mentors to friends, to family who actually believe in us, right? Who understand the sacrifices that we're going to make. So for me, it was primarily um, making sure that those types of people don't infiltrate my judgment in myself, right? So if I quit my job and move into a ghetto and I knock on doors and my lifestyle is not very, let's say, boozy at all, if anything, the exact opposite, um, who would judge me and who wouldn't? And those who judge me need to go and meet them. Because what I want to do in my life is significantly more than just impress them, right? Significantly more. So that's the first thing. I think the, the first thing I did was made thought of the process of elimination of people who are going to be supporting me and who wouldn't be supporting me, and then cut those accordingly. And as I progressed, um, that, that's always been on top of my mind. But most importantly, what that did was it didn't ever feel that hard. It genuinely, people said, like, you know, starting a business is hard, man. Hating your fucking life and having to pay some money is way harder. It's way, way harder. <laughs> like, it, 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 it is hell, man, in comparison. Uh, the second thing is be willing to do whatever it takes. I mean, when you set a goal, like, you have to really, really want it. Like I said, and the second thing is what are you willing to give up? In my case, and, and what are you willing to add? It was knocking on doors. So, Knocking on doors was a big factor of getting my first handful of clients. And when people say, oh, I don't know about, you know, today you can't knock on doors. Man, if you got knuckles, you can knock on doors. And the truth is, most people don't even do it anymore. So you have like this massive competitive advantage, right? Go do this, you can go knock on doors. Um, that, that was one of the biggest things that most people think it's challenging, but it isn't. It isn't. It's just a fear of rejection, a fear of failure, right? And eventually, it's a, you know, the more doors you go on, the more... Um, uh, analytical you could become in terms of how are you pitching it, what are you saying uh, to, to like, you know, all the other logistical components. For me, it was like Friday evening, 7 p.m. was a great time to knock on doors because people were outside having a glass of wine uh, on their front uh, porch, just, you know, admiring the beautiful weather. Great. That's in my benefit then. And so as I approach them, I can have a conversation with them instead of knocking the door where it's just an awkward thing where just getting the door open, right? Um, so th there was all these other things that you start to learn. And when knocking doors, you know, uh, if I exploited the entire area of doors, I would drive to like uh, a Walmart or um, a very similar store um, that, that was at the time retail was pretty big. 
And I'd stand outside and then parents would walk in and I'd say, hey, give me a tutor. It was very, very awkward. But uh, I did, get a, I definitely got a few clients from that. Uh, eventually, you know, uh, Walmart would kick me out of the lot uh, and then tell me if I come back, I'll get charged for solicitation and trespassing. Uh, and then I just drive to the next Walmart and do it again. I mean, there's a lot of Walmarts here. <laughs> so it was <laughs> beneficial for me. So the thing is, like, you always have opportunity if you're willing to do the work, right? Like, that's the thing. That that was a, a decision I made at the very beginning. I'm willing to do this. I'm definitely willing to do this. And it, it also, not just the willingness, what it taught me, though, too, it gave me this really interesting sense of confidence of deserving as I remember thinking, like, um, when we were really, really, like, I mean, it was me and another guy, I'm uh, primarily, like, pretty much a co-founder of mine who, who was doing this. And I remember thinking, like, there's a lot of, there's much larger players in the world, but the reason why I'm never going to be scared is because I know how far I'm willing to go to grow my business. Because I know they're not going to be willing to do this. So there's all this weird sense of deserving that in it. Um, eventually, uh, between me and my co-founder, we couldn't tutor this, the students between us because the referral started growing. And the reason why the referral started growing wasn't because we were certified teachers or because we were good, uh, like, like, we, we had some expertise in tutoring. It was truly because we just, I thought of every single student as if they were my own child. When a parent called me for tutoring, they called me, they don't realize this, <laughs> I can say it now, but I looked at it and be like, wow, you just gave me the keys to your child's future. I better not fuck this up. Like oh. I have to do everything. So if I was taking on like a, I hated chemistry in high school, but if I was taking on like a year 12 chem student or grade 12 chem student, I'd relearn the entire unit. I would like go inside and out and like thinking about it, how would I teach this? So like that one hour tutoring that I did with them took 10 hours of prep, right? Like it, nobody really knew what was going on the back end, but for me it was like, my job is to make sure that you love this. And even if you don't love chemistry, I want you to gain the confidence that you're capable of doing well at it, because if because this will transcend into everything and anything that you'll ever put your mind to. If you can overcome an adversity in your life, that is a layer of confidence that you're going to have. And that's my obligation to you, is to make sure I can deliver layers of confidence for you. So that that's how we really started to grow. And then eventually the referral started growing. Um, so we had to hire tutors. And in hiring tutors, um, because of we cared so much. It was really, really, really challenging to, uh, man, it, <laughs> it, it, like it, the training was weird. We, so we created the first tutor training program in the world because of this. Uh, I needed to make sure that they had a level of optimism. Well, not just a level. They had extreme optimism, extreme hope. They were semi-motivational speakers slash semi-great um, educators. I didn't care if you where you went to school. Um, my thing was, do you have competency of the subject matter? Okay, great. Now I want to see if you can communicate this, right? In the most hardest, difficult setting, because you're taking a defeated human being who usually thinks that they're not capable, and now you have to instill capabilities in them. So it was this really cool thing. And then we just started to, because they started performing really well, um, the referrals just kept growing. And I remember, like, it was probably about two years in, I, me and my co-founder were talking, like, holy shit, man, we got a pretty solid business here. Um, and it, 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 we, we franchised part of the business, which was really interesting. Like it, we had some really, really good partners and there was some times where we actually awarded a, a not so good partner with the franchise. And it was in 2015 when we were, had some really 2015, 2016 is when we really had to make a decision then, of do we franchise the business fully or do we do it in a really selective, uh, way? Um, and we decided, and interestingly enough, we had all these franchise deals pending uh, at the time, like really that would have been extremely liquid for us, would have been really good for our cash flow. And we all sat there at our entire executive team and said, you know what, let's do this selectively. We made a commitment to the families that we that use us. We made a commitment to our current partners that are franchise partners. And we made a commitment to ourselves that we were gonna that we were gonna only do good beyond having extreme profit. So let's let's do it the right way. And we took a slower burn growth, but what happened was that we were able to grow with the right people and build a reputation uh, around education that's never been built before, to not think of it as, as academics, but to think about it as the student's well-being, as that academics is just a vehicle to develop your, your own well-being, not a vehicle to learn the chems, the physics, the bios, the maths, the, the languages. It is much, much more than that. It's an opportunity to learn how to embrace failure. It's an opportunity to stack, the build, stack your levels of confidence. It's an opportunity to see that hope Hope is something you can hold on to and you can instill in your life because that will allow you to achieve everything. I love that. 
it's a great story. And yeah, the, I can imagine there'd definitely be a lot of challenges, especially with the franchising model. Um, just making sure you're getting the right people who share your vision and, and have the similar sort of vision as well. So yeah, I can, I can imagine. Well, and that's one of the things like franchising, you know, it, it, it's, it's, con- it's honestly hit or miss. If it's a hit, it's amazing. If it's a miss, well, it can be quite detrimental. So I, I knew if we, you know, grew would be a franchising, we, you know, we'd have a lot of hits, but we'd also have a lot of miss. And I didn't want to really risk that. Uh, and it's impossible to know if it's going to work out until after the fact. So I knew that, you know, like, why take the risk with it? There's too much yeah. of that. Like, I can understand if perhaps if you're selling something that you may not care as much about, let's say if you're selling some sort of product or food that you're like, whatever, it's fine. If somebody gets a bad meal, it's not the end of the world. If you get a bad tutor, it could be pretty devastating for a child. It, it is, wow, I'm dumb. I'm even as dumb with the tutor. I'm capable of nothing. So the yeah. risk is way too high, way, way, way too high. Yeah. Got it. Was it sounds like there was something uh, the Toronto Business Development Center that you kind of were a part of early on in the journey as well. Was that something that contributed to the growth at all or Fuck yeah, man. It was amazing. Okay, so this is when we started was before like the so you're in Australia, so I, I know you guys have um, co working offices around, right? Especially in Melbourne, there's a few. Um, I don't care we works and other things like that there, but um this didn't exist before. There was no such thing as co-working. There was no like shared office spaces. Like was through like a large. It wasn't shared office space. You you went into like like where they manufactured kind of a unit for you like really quickly and and you paid like some sort of rent. It, it was like shitty because there was no entrepreneurial spirit, right? If anything, actually at the time that I was starting out, which isn't that long ago, like ten years ago, entrepreneurship meant you were unemployed. Like <laughs> the truth is like. Like, you usually became an entrepreneur because you weren't the most employable human being. It's not because you had the craziest idea in the world. It, those were few and far between. You, it was uh, not very employable. Um, <laughs> now entrepreneurship has this cool, like, you know, this, this massive cool factor with it. But at that time, there wasn't any. And uh, we were working in my condo, um, at the, and it was getting packed, man. Like, there was no room. Like, uh, I mean, the photocopier would replace the microwave. Uh, we <laughs> just like, I, it, it's like living where you work for the first two to three years of your business is great because all you do is the business. But eventually, like, it, it caught up to me and I didn't have like, a, I, did, I feel like you couldn't get creative as well. Like, I, I couldn't change my environment. So me and my co-founder were talking about like, what if we could get an office space? So we, one day we took a drive downtown Toronto and we started looking at buildings that had openings. They're just way, way, way too out of, out of range in terms of price. And weirdly enough, we heard of this thing called Toronto Business Development Center. And we uh, booked a meeting to check it out. And they had these like really micro offices. I'm talking like, uh, you guys probably use square meters. I'm more familiar with square feet, but it's probably about a, like 100 square feet, maybe a little bit less, 80 square feet. So pretty small, like smaller than a bedroom typically. Uh, and they offered it at a really, really, really low rate. In addition to it, everybody in there was kind of like on their startup journey. So everybody, was kind of just jiving out to like, hey, I'm trying to make the world a better place, get my business off the ground. And I really, really dig that atmosphere. I thought it was amazing. I thought this was like, fuck, this is great. Like everybody's kind of the same mentality. So we, they accepted us into their program, which was, their program was essentially office space uh, with some supporting, um, I was mainly actually, fuck it, it was mainly office space. <laughs> they probably don't like the fact that I say that, but it was mainly office space. But the truth is the other tenants made everything. One of the, t- of the tenants from across from us, I uh, one of my closest friends, but he painted it, one of his, this is, he painted one of the walls with a whiteboard, right? At the time, whiteboard paint was like, I never even seen this shit before. So I was like, this is crazy. And we'd stay till like after uh, we were done work, let's say both around like 9 p.m., we'd all get in there and brainstorm our futures. And it was crazy because we we constantly talk about the vision, but we feel the vision. The energy was electric, man. So it was, it was, there was no, it was, It was beyond home. It was beyond home. It was like a place, a really safe place to thrive. When we were safe, like when I was telling you about going against the grain, this changed everything. Everybody was rooting for me. And I was rooting for everybody. Like every, like our first media came from that place to our first franchise sale came out of that place to like when we hit like record revenue numbers came out of that place. And it was like, we'd celebrate these victories together. So they were, they were, although the other tenants weren't, 
like legally part of my business, they were pertinent to my success because without them, I would have felt like I was going against the grain. I never had to justify like a late night working or like how I'm going to like finesse this deal structure or, or like the fears of like, you know, whatever it is that every business goes through, especially in the beginning stages was just normalized. It was so beautiful, man. It was like being around greatness constantly and everybody helping you get to where they think you can go. They all see, they all see the potential that you see in yourself and you help raise each other up. The way I describe it is like we were all going to the moon and our responsibility was to pour fuel in each other's rocket ships. And that's why I, I, I was, it was, it was, it was uh, unreal. Although we were only there for, I think for like a year and a half, maybe two years max. Uh, and then we had to get a, we outgrew the space. Um, it was, yeah, oh man, it was, it was phenomenal. I, I recommend anybody that's starting out when they're deciding to, you know, work from home or for working space. The question isn't value. The question is affordability. If you can afford it and it's a couple hundred a month and, and it's truly there, there's something about the, the energy and the conversations that you're going to have that will change everything in the direction that you want it to go. Yeah, I love that. And like you said, it, it, at the end of the day, it is just office space, but then there's so much more because you get you can feed off the other people there who are on the similar sort of journey. So, oh, it's so beautiful, that. man. It's, it's like <laughs> magic in the walls. That's what I used to think. It's magic in the walls here, right? It's, it's the magic of entrepreneurship, the magic of love, the magic of the optimism, the magic of hope. It's, it was it was beautiful, man, and it's, it's I wouldn't we wouldn't be having this podcast if I wasn't part of that team. There's no way. Wow, yeah, it's awesome. I love that. So you mentioned briefly as well. That's where your first media came from, and that was something I was interested to ask you about as well because you seem to get a lot of media. I've seen a lot of clips on of you on TV throughout your journey. One thing I noticed is that you've gotten a lot more ripped over the years. You must have been working out in your first <laughs> TV appearances. You yeah. Know. You're a yeah. bit smaller, but um, so how do you actually get all that media? I'm curious. Yeah, there's a couple things. Our first media was in 2000, like a big, like kind of like channel, like where it would, where it was like, wow, we got good media. It was probably 2011. Actually, uh, we got ranked at like for like top entrepreneurs in Toronto, but it's kind of like a bullshit ranking. So it, but it was by a big publication, um, and it was it was it was really exciting because I saw like. The, the the every it was interesting because what I learned from that was that then all these people that were doubters kind of like hoisted you up. It was like, oh my god, you're making it now. I'm supporting you, and it's like, although like it's when you know your haters become your supporters. It it I the more people are hoisting you up and believing in you, that's collective great energy, and I and I felt that. And and then um actually our first media was really interesting. It it kind of came serendipitous. Uh, there was a like a. a a famous show here in Canada that, that did like business analysis report. Um, and they were interviewing companies based on like this ranking. Uh, and I was one of the companies that they were interviewing to see if they, if I was TV viable, right. If, if I had the ability to, uh, to make this business news network kind of television show. And they said, uh, after the call, uh, they send out like, you know, who they're going to put on the show and I wasn't on the list. <laughs> and I was like, Oh fuck, I guess, I, you know, maybe it's the way I pitched it. Maybe like I got a lot to learn in terms of pitching the media. And there was a, a really nice individual who was actually a staff in Toronto Business Development Center. And I told him like how like, uh, like this kind of sucks. And he said like, you know, m- a morning show is much better up my alley because that's what parents watch anyways. Why do I want to be on Business News Network? And I looked at him and I was like, I'll give you $500 if you can get me on a more on like Canada's top morning show. And in like two months, he did it. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> He's like, you're going on air, and he came with me, and we wa- worked through a script. And and at the time, I was doing a couple speeches, not like a lot. Um, so I didn't have a, like, a lot of media experience. Um, and I did my first morning show, and it went, it went fairly well. Uh, and then they kind of trickle in and out. Um, and then it started to really pour when I started to talk a lot more about what our company stood for. Because it wasn't like, hey, here's another tutoring company. It's like Sunny Verma, the brand, versus Tutor Bright, the brand. Sunny Verma, although we care about the exact same thing, by kind of step, separating and being like, this guy, well, comes with this really interesting angle because he talks about motivation, self-esteem, self-worth, but he's classified as an education expert based on his experience working with probably more kids than anybody in human history, um, can give you really interesting um, thoughts and insights on your child's academics, but also on yourself and how you feel about life as well. And when we started playing that angle, media started picking it up. Uh, And my first ones were really like, it was 
like started becoming actually a lot smaller outlets. But I remember thinking, uh, I gotta, I gotta go on this, like thinking like I'm going on like the Oprah Winfrey show or the Ellen DeGeneres show. Um, not, not in terms of like that was all with the end goal. It was like the amount of preparation and thought that would go into a four minute segment was fucking crazy, man. It was for at, at the beginning for every one minute I was on air was probably about 25 hours of prep. And if you wow. do, that's like a hundred, a <laughs> hundred hours per segment. And I sucked. It was, it was <laughs> Like, like I'd watch it like, oh, it could get a little cringeworthy, but it was good because the, the preparation showed me like, oh, did I over prep? Did I, I, what did I say wrong here? What did I not like about it? And, but the thing is, I, I felt like I sucked, but the, the producers did it. So they call me back and again and again, and then a bigger outlet would pick it up and be like, oh, that was really interesting. And I like what you said there. Can you say it on our channel? And then, it, and then we had hired this publicist who's phenomenal. Like he's, he's amazing. And it just started looking. Like it all started lining up and the preparation really started to pay off. Now the preparation is not nearly that is because I do for a living. I, I talk about this, but it, it was, it was beautiful because what it did, it showed me that the, the importance of personal branding or business branding is critical. Everybody's going to be competing on cost per click, Google AdWords to like signage along the street. So whether that be like a, a street sign or a billboard or whatever it may be, but where you can really, really angle it is on what your core values are and what you really care about that has nothing to do with your business. Like when people watch those TV shows, they aren't like, oh my God, I got to sign up for Tutor Bright. They're thinking, oh, I can actually teach my kids about affirmation or I can write a graduate letter with my kids this evening or yeah, I can do a vision board with my children to get them to start to envision how amazing their life could be. Whatever whatever it may be, is those are the tidbits. Those are the tidbits that start to build on what our brand values are. Um, and we angle it. Like I, need, I, I, I thought about that play prior to this um, and, but it, it really started to work out into our favor because when people see us or hear us, we're, you know, we, we stand for this, of course. And, and in addition to it, it really helped a lot, but media in itself, like it, it started to grow by preparation, 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 preparation. And after significant amount of prep, um, it becomes a lot more, you become a lot more comfortable and natural at it. Uh, what happens is that you become the go-to, the go-to for a specific, you know, ideology or whatever it may be. And that really, really plays in a massive, massive benefit, like a massive, massive benefit uh, for the business as a whole. Like it, it helps you, you know, you like, not that we turn down clients, but I mean, we have our, our picking of the litter because people like, you know, for example, the New York Times one that came out, like the phone didn't stop ringing off the hook because of it. Uh, it's it's like these things that really play, and not once in there were we talking about tutoring. We were talking about embracing failure and and the mentality that you really need in order to embrace failure. But these are things that resonate with any parent and any human being for that matter. Makes total sense. I love that, and it's it's great as well to to share the the amount of time and effort you put behind the scenes. People only see the the four minute segment, but they don't see the hours behind, behind it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you're so fucking natural. And I'm like, no, you have no clue. <laughs> Blue. there's not like I, I believe in nurture versus natural i i truly do like i think you have to nurture yourself into what you really want to become and i think it's really important that you have to be your biggest critic which we tend to be but you have to also be your biggest complimenter that's where true balance and lie and life lies like if you can understand everything you did good and you worked on bingo 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 and then everything that you need to improve upon like saying ah, i tried this but it didn't work or that didn't land and how could i say that better like that, that's a like gameplay, man. Like, I, like every single time I do a speech or a media thing, like I'll go watch it back and watch the video immediately and critique it. Be like, oh, I could have done that better. I could have done this better. Oh, I, but I did this really well and play it. So then I know next time what I, what I'm looking at improving. So every single time becomes a, a level of improvement, but that then by improving, then the next large media outlets are like, Hey, that guy is really good at this. So let's get him on air. Yeah. Makes total sense. And that's a key point worth highlighting as well, actually reviewing the stuff you've done. I do the same thing with the podcast. I listen back to every interview to, so you can kind of look at it objectively and say, I should have said this or I shouldn't have said that or I should have taken things this direction. So I totally get it. And sort of coming up on the on time here, Sonny, you've shared a lot of, a lot of value in this interview. So I really appreciate that. And just a few, few quick questions just to close it out. Just want to know what's, what's next for you um, this year and beyond. What are you working on with Tudor Bright? What's what's coming up for for you personally? Sure. Have you have you heard of the book Thinking Grow Rich? Yes. Okay. So um, that's a book that changed my life drastically. It changed my family's life. When I was growing up, my parents declared personal bankruptcy when I was six years old, and that's the book my dad would 100% say got our family out of personal bankruptcy. It's a book I read 
before starting to write. It's a book that I gift probably more than any book I've ever gifted. I mean, over a thousand copies I've gifted to date. Wow. Sure. Uh, <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I had the opportunity of meeting Napoleon Hill, who's the author. I had the opportunity of meeting the head of his foundation. He, he died in, I believe, the, the late 70s. Um, and they loved the work that I was doing. Um, so they've uh, asked me to uh, write a rendition of Think and Grow Rich. Um, so we are working through the sort of like the logistics of what that would look like. Um, and to to kind of put Thinking Grow Rich back on the map, although it is still on the map, it's the number one, um, the number one without question self development book of all time. I think it's sold about 120 million copies. Uh, but to bring it back to life for the millennial or the Gen Z um, generation, that it's really important that they can develop a similar mindset that was given by Napoleon Hill when he published it, and I believe it was 1937. So it's it's really important to do that. And secondly, like everything that stands for from like like you asked me a day about goal setting like from finding your your true desire to to understanding how to actually develop uh, a goal and structure in place to how do you persist throughout every single adversity how do you build resilience in your life to how do you do this all with a smile on your face how do you do this even even when like like when things don't seem very pleasant but to see the good in it right how do you change the lens of, of pessimism and negativity to the lens of optimism and positivity in your life because that's where the magic of life really lies that's where the moments of life really lie so one thing that book taught me is that you know time is 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 man-made we, we've come up with the concepts of days and, and minutes and hours and years but what isn't man-made is moments uh like when you when you're going to be on your deathbed, you're not going to remember the number of years that you live. You're going to remember the moments that you shared. And usually it's going to be the moments that you shared with people that you loved and moments that really brought a smile to your face. Um, so understanding how often are you smiling and being able to repeat that more and more is absolutely the, the best gift you can give yourself. And that's what that book taught me. And that's what I'm excited to rewrite and give to others. Wow. That's such a great project. I can't wait to, to see how that unfolds. Yeah, me too. <laughs> awesome. And is there anything I haven't asked you or just anything you want to make sure you pass on to the audience before we finish up here, Sonny? Uh, no, other than life is, life is amazing. It's so beautiful. It's such a blessing to just be alive. And, and although there is this, this rise of, um, of, uh, of depression and sadness in the world, it's all in our head. We have the opportunity at the same time to create love, optimism, hope, uh, and more smiles in their life. So other than life is beautiful and it's just a blessing. That's just it. I love it. Great message. Last question is just what's the best way for people to connect with you, Sonny? If they want to check out a bit more about Tudor Bride or find out what you're up to, what's the best way? Instagram for that at sunnyv underscore TV or at Tudor Bright is the best way. Great. And we'll link them up in the show notes. But guys listening, Make sure you check out what Sonny's up to. It's a super important mis mission and he's doing amazing work in the education space and beyond, as you've heard in the past hour. So, Sonny, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate you shared a lot of knowledge and I can't wait to have everyone listen. Thanks so much, James. Take care. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to this interview with Sonny. I really hope you got a lot of value out of it. And I've got a real quick favor to ask. If you're listening to this in Apple Podcasts, please leave me a rating and a review because it really helps out with the show ranking, helps more people discover the show and helps when I'm reaching out to potential guests in the future, giving the show more credibility. And if you're not listening to this on iOS, you can still take a screenshot of whatever app you're using, post it to your Instagram stories, tag me at jharris, two R's and three S's, and if you could do one of those things, it would really help me out and it would, would mean the world. So thank you so much for doing that and have a great day, everyone.